Okay, now, this is lecture number four, and it's about convolution and Laplace transforms. These might seem a little obscure topics, but they will come in very useful later on, I promise you. So what is convolution and why do we need it? Well, think about it. An observed shut time will consist of a random number of oscillations between one shut state and another. And the time spent in each individual shut state should be exponentially distributed. But what we're interested in is the sum of the times that it takes for all of those oscillations. Similarly, of course, for an open time. E even more complicated, a burst of openings consists of oscillations between open states, among the open states, and then among short-lived shut states, and then among more open states. And to find the distribution of the burst length, all of these things must be added up. So we need, for example, to find the distribution of the sum of a random number of random intervals. And this is what convolution does for us. Lastly, convolution is made very much simpler by using the tricks called Laplace transforms. So here we go. The operation of convolution occurs in many different contexts, but two of those contexts are of particular use to us. One is to work out the relationship between the input and output of a filter. Filters are important to reduce high frequency noise in recordings, but I'm not going to deal with that one. Convolution is also the means by which you find the distribution of the sum of several different variables. Think of two variables, for example, an open time and a shut time. And they have probability density functions F1 and F2, say. We want to know the probability density function of the variable found by adding one value to from each. So T1 plus T2 is an open time and a shut time. And when you think about it, this some could be made up in different ways. We want the probability density for the sum being 10 milliseconds. It could be made up with the first sojourn being one millisecond and the second being nine milliseconds. But we also get a 10 millisecond sum by the first interval being two milliseconds and the second being eight milliseconds. Or the th first being three milliseconds and the second being seven milliseconds. Or the first being nine milliseconds and the last being one millisecond. So in general, we're interested in the length of T equals T1 plus T2. So to get the value for a particular T, if T1 is tau, then T2 must be T minus tau like that. So we want to add up all these possibilities. Well, of course, time is a continuous variable, not just integers. So the sum becomes an integral and it becomes the integral of an integral like this. So this is called a convolution integral. So the probability density function of the sum of the two variables is the integral over tau that the first interval is the length tau and the second is the length t minus tau and tau goes from naught up to t and in simple cases that can be worked out explicitly using this integral if it's a thing that's easy to integrate Suppose both variables are exponentially distributed, but with different means, for example. And that both are 
the fact that both are six exponentially distributed means that there's only one state, one open state and one shut state. That's most unlikely to occur in practice, but it's a nice simple example. So the first one is exponentially distributed with a mean of one over alpha. The second one is exponentially distributed with a mean of one over beta. So the integrand is this, that's the F1 of tau, that's F2 of T minus tau, which can be written in this form. So the tau only occurs once and you can do integrate that fairly easily. And the answer comes out to be, as long as alpha isn't equal to beta, comes out to be this. So F of T is the difference between two exponential components. And the mean length of this sum is one over alpha plus one over beta, which is the sum of the mean lengths for the first interval and for the second interval. So that's very intuitively obvious. You can do it more easily, usually more easily anyway, with the Laplace transform. What's the Laplace transform? That's the curly L represents the Laplace transform of a function of T. And that is Laplace transform is usually denoted by a superscript asterisk. And the argument is changed from time to this variable S. And that's the, the Laplace transform is defined in this way, e to the minus st, f of t dt. Um, now, why does that help things? Well, let's, uh, let's say a couple more things about the Laplace transform before going on. t is time and f of t is a probability density function which has the dimensions of reciprocal seconds. And in that case, S has the dimensions of reciprocal seconds and the transform S star of S is dimensionless. The function is converted from a function of time into a function of frequency. Um, S is usually the variable used for a Laplace transform. It's a bit unfortunate because it, it's not to be confused with the dimensions of seconds. One useful trick you can do straight away is to notice that it follows from the definition that if you set S equals naught in a Laplace transform, so you get F star of naught, then this exponential term is e to the naught, which is one. So it reduces to this form, which is simply the total area under the function. If the function was a probability density function, that would be one, of course. But this is the really important trick you can do with Laplace transforms from our point of view. The product of, La of Laplace transforms of two functions gives the Laplace transform of their convolution. In other words, the Laplace transform turns convolution into multiplication in exactly the same way as a logarithmic transform turns multiplication into addition. That means you can involve uh, things of arbitrary complexity by multiplying their Laplace transforms. So if we consider the example we just worked out explicitly by the sum of two variables, both exponentially distributed, one with mean one over alpha, the other with mean one over beta. Well, you can find the Laplace transform of functions from tables. And in fact, nowadays, most mathematical programs that have symbolic maths in them can give it for you, programs like MathCAD and Mathematica and so on. I'll just state for the moment though that the Laplace transform of an exponential is one over alpha plus s. The variable is changed from time 
to frequency. So to convolve F1 of T with F2 of T, we multiply their Laplace transforms. That's alpha on alpha plus S times beta on beta plus S. And with a bit of rearrangement, you can get it into this form. So the inverse transform of that is an exponential. The inverse transform of that is an exponential. And that gives the, so the inverse transform gives the convolution of T1 and T2. And that comes out exactly as it did when you did it by hand. We can generalize that. Let's consider the sum of n exponentially distributed intervals. This time, though, we'll assume that all the intervals have the same distribution. They're all distributed exponentially with a mean 1 over alpha. So the Laplace transform is alpha over s plus alpha. To convolve n such intervals, we just multiply this by itself n times. So the Laplace transform of the distribution of the sum of n exponentially distributed intervals is that. We can use tables or a program to find the inverse of that, and it gives the, dis the result of the, the inverse of this transform is that. And this is a special case of a thing called a gamma distribution. We can just check what shape we'd expect that distribution to have. Well, for n equals 1, of course, it's just an exponential distribution. For n equals 2, it looks like this. It goes through a peak. It's unlikely you get a very short interval because you'd have to have both the first and the second interval very short to get their sum to be very short. So this is small for short times, goes through a p. The mean of this positively skewed distribution, in fact, is 2. This is assuming that the mean for the single exponential was 1. And if you look at it for a sum of four exponentially distributed intervals, it looks like that. These are getting eventually converge to a normal distribution, in fact, but that doesn't matter. In fact, this whole exercise is not very useful because we don't usually uh, want to consider a fixed number of exponentials. We want to consider usually a random number of exponentials. So that, that's the real problem we need to deal with. It's a bit more complicated. So now we want to, to do the most interesting case of all, the convolution of, by convolving Laplace transforms. And it's the sum of the random number of exponentially distributed intervals. Each interval has the same distribution, exponential, the mean of one over alpha. So the distribution for each individual interval is that, and the Laplace transform is that. But we now need to consider also the distribution of the number of intervals in a sum of a random number of them. In the simplest case, by random we mean the number that follows a geometric distribution. It can be generalized, as we'll see later, to a number that follows a mixture of geometric distributions, but we'll stick to the simplest case for now. And that gives the probability of seeing r intervals as pi to the r minus 1, 1 minus pi, where pi defines the mean number of intervals. For example, if pi was 0 0.5, then this would, the mean number of intervals would be 2. So how do we combine these two to get the Laplace transform of the sum of this random number of exponentially distributed intervals? Well, in the case 
where there are R intervals, then as before, the Laplace transform is, has to be raised to the power R multiplied by itself R times. But that needs to be multiplied by the probability that the, there are R intervals. And this needs then to be added up for all the possibilities from R equals one interval up to an infinite number. And that can be expressed substituting for the probability of R in this way. And this infinite sum comes out to be alpha on MR over S plus alpha to the uh, alpha on MR. This, we'll see why this sum comes to that on a slide shortly. Now you can see that this has exactly the same form as that. So the inverse transform is just an exponential distribution which has a mean of MR on alpha. That's a very simple result because it says that the sum of a, a random number of exponentially distributed intervals is itself exponential and its mean length is the mean number of openings, mean number of intervals times the lifetime of a single interval. It could hardly be simpler than that. So how did that infinite sum come out so simply? Well, here's two useful rules about the sums of series. The sum of an infinite series of numbers p to the r minus one times one minus p, uh, that's, or r goes from one to infinity, is simply one. How can that be? Well, just write out the terms. For r equals one, then this is p to the naught, which is one, so we just have one minus p. For r equals two, we have p times one minus p. For r equals three, we have p squared times one minus p. Multiply out these brackets and you get one minus p plus p minus p squared plus p squared. It's pretty obvious that these all cancel each other out. So the answer is just one. A, a related, closely related infinite series, which is a form useful for finding the mean of a distribution. We multiply e each of these. This is the same as before. Uh, P to the R minus one, one minus P, but each term is multiplied by R. And that comes out simply to one on one minus p. All of these things, of course, only work if p is less than one. How is that the case? Well, just write out the terms of this. So we get one minus p for the first term, two p one into one minus p for the second term and so on. Multiplying out these brackets, we get this. The terms don't cancel each other out exactly, but they come to one plus p plus p squared plus p cubed. Now, if we multiply all of these by one minus p, we get the series up here, which came to one. So that proves that this sum is one over one minus p. Very simple result from summing an infinite number of terms. Now, why is this so useful? Well, one reason is because it explains why the end plate current decays in a good approximation to a single exponential. We have said that the unitary event, as far as the synapse is concerned, is not actually single bursts, but it's not actually single openings, but bursts of several openings like that one. This is 
now I think fairly well established. So this diagram which we used in the first lecture to explain why in terms of what's happening in single molecules, why the current decays exponentially, these openings should be replaced by bursts of openings. The bursts are very different lengths, some are short, some are long. But if you add them up, you get an exponential decay if the length of these things is exponential. And that is going to be approximately the case. If we just look at the total length of the burst, it consists of R openings. And R minus one shuttings, but the shuttings are very brief compared with the openings. So if we just approximate this as being the sum of R open times, then its distribution should be exponential according to what we've just uh, derived and its mean should be the the mean number of openings times the length of an opening so although these are bursts they're roughly exponentially distributed and so the their sum gives a uh, decay which is it has a time constant equal to the mean burst length. That when the openings all uh, start at more or less the same time produced by a short pulse of agonist. But we, when we considered the waiting time paradox, we realized that this will come out the same if the receptors were initially at equilibrium with the agonist and the agonist was suddenly reduced at time zero then you get the same exponential decay with the mean equal to the mean burst length later we shall derive a more exact expression for the mean burst length but that's a good approximation in many cases Finally, we'll consider two useful things that you can get from a Laplace transform without having to invert them at all. One we've mentioned already, setting S equals naught in the Laplace transform gives you the area under the function. So F of T is a probability density function, that area will be one. Now the second case to show that the mean of the distribution mu say is given by differentiating the Laplace transform with respect to S, changing its sign and setting S equal to zero. Well, first we note that the thing in the square brackets comes to this. This is the differentiation with respect to S. This is the definition of the Laplace transform. Now we can reverse the order of differentiation and integration here. There are cases where that's not valid, but usually it is. And if we do that, we can just differentiate e to the minus s t with respect to s, which gives you t e to the minus s t. And now we want to set s equals naught in that. So the exponential term is one, and that gives you this expression, which is just the standard expression for the mean of any distribution. Lastly, we want to deal with a more general case, or we shall want to deal with a more general case later. So far, we've considered the convolution of exponentially distributed intervals, simple exponentially distributed intervals. But in general, we need to do something more general than that. This is the last Laplace transform of a single exponential, as we've mentioned repeatedly. 
but the time-dependent part of a distribution is generally e to the QAAT, where AA is uh, the a sub matrix of the Q matrix. Or for shut times, it'd be QFF. The initials uh, there will vary according to the problem. And the Laplace transform of that, it's easy to show with the rules we've given already, is going to be SI minus QAA, the inverse of that matrix. This you see is exactly like that, except the reciprocal is replaced by an inverse, you can't take one over a matrix, and S is replaced by S times the identity matrix, because it's got to be the same size as QAA to subtract them. So this general form will be very useful in subsequent lectures. And that's it. Okay.